Anyone who believes in indefinite growth on a physically finite planet is either mad or an economist. We don't want to focus politics on a notion that involves the rejection of principles around which a large majority of our fellow citizens organize their lives. We are not as endlessly manipulable and as predictable as you would think. What I'm going to be talking about will be a certain sort of neighborhood that tends to be found in the outskirts and the darker interstices of major cities beyond the ends of tram lines and so on that we tend not to notice or if we do to attempt to re reject or force out. This is a place called Bulak al Dakrur, which is uh, in Giza just to the west of, uh, in fact, physically adjoining central Cairo. Uh, it came into being, for the most part, in the 1970s, uh, when people arrived from Upper Egypt and squatted on privately owned farmland for which they'd paid, subdivided and so on, built their own self-built neighborhood that is now home to certainly more than half a million people just in this neighborhood. It is one of uh, about 70 such neighborhoods uh, in Cairo that make up about a third of its population. It's a haphazard labyrinth of a neighborhood of narrow alleys, smells, endless activity. Most Egyptians would call this an ashwayat, which means a chaotic place. Uh, most better off Cairo residents wouldn't set foot here unless it was to get their car repaired or to uh, get an electric fan repaired or something like that. It's known as a place where uh, waste goods get repurposed uh, in creative ways and so on. It's also known as a place of foment. And indeed, on January 25th, it was, it was in Bulak, right around here, that the first crowds formed uh, outside of a sweet shop, uh, gathered into the thousands and marched on Tahrir Square. Why were they frustrated? The residents of Bulak had used their neighborhood as a platform for, to propel themselves into urban life from the village. They uh, used their property which they owned, the small patches of land they'd bought, the self-built houses above them, and the rising value of that property to finance small businesses. And they started to develop what, you, what I'd call an arrival city, lower middle class of merchants and small factory owners who uh, maybe were making, you know, five, seven, nine thousand dollars per year per family and who had higher ambitions for the education and business success of their families. But they were constantly frustrated in their lives in Bulak by the established middle class of Cairo. And this established class had frustrated Bulak's residents' ambitions in a number of ways. First of all, physically, uh, at first by trying to bulldoze places like Bulak and uh, move the residents into high-rise enclaves outside the city, which officially were much better housing, supported by Western aid organizations, but no physical space in the buildings to run a shop, and no physical access for the people from the inner city to reach your shop, buy your things, or for you to reach the main clusters of low-end employment in the city. They also isolated it by not recognizing it officially, and therefore not giving it infrastructure. Bulak, while it immediately adjoins central Cairo, Cairo, is isolated by a canal and by a whole series of very busy railway tracks and often walls with only a few pedestrian bridges, meaning that uh, uh, if you have a small business, it's almost impossible to get people there. If you want a job, it's, it takes you half an hour rather than 10 minutes to get there. All the city buses are located on the other side of the canal from Bulak. Despite having more than half a million people, it has exactly zero public secondary schools within it. This sort of neighborhood uh, is uh, increasingly creating the conflicts and the sources of stability around the world, but also in the Western world, as migration increasingly is linked to the villages of the developing world, in the Chinatowns, Little Indias, Plattenbau communities, Banlieu Difficile, and immigrant neighborhoods of the Western world were seeing the same tensions because I'm arguing the neighborhoods function socially and economically in the same way. The bottom rung of establishment in the city is linked to the originating village and links itself into the core economy of the city in the same way whether you're talking about uh, a tin roofed slum in Mumbai or a high rise enclave outside of a European or North American city. This is the Faubourg Saint-Antoine in 1789. 
just outside the old walls of Paris. It was home to tanneries and workshops and so on. It was the most volatile and smelly and densely populated of these Faubourg, and its population uh, almost entirely were rural migrants from elsewhere in France who often started out as seasonal migrants, staying there for uh, in between harvest seasons to make some extra money to support the farm and so on, establishing themselves more and more and becoming increasingly frustrated with their lack of access to the city's amenities and so on. And it was these people who stormed the Bastille. Of the 635 people police captured that night, 400 were, quote, of provincial extraction. That is, they were rural to urban migrants living in Paris. And this was true of most of the revolutions and uprisings of the 19th century, that the majority of the crowd were the people who had migrated from a rural area. Though they were rarely either the organizers or the beneficiaries in the end of these uprisings, Especially after 1848, the rural to urban shift in Europe became a source of great social mobility. The move from peasant life to cities ended famine and starvation as commonplace phenomena in the West by converting land into food production, often cataclysmically, but in the end uh, in a way that was sustainable and stable. And it ad added, ended exponential population growth as a phenomenon in both Europe and North America because urban family sizes are universally so much smaller than rural ones. After the Second World War, in the decades of rapid decolonization, we began to witness the formation of large arrival city enclaves in what was then called the Third World, first in South America and the Middle East, then in the Indian subcontinent, gradually in Africa, people coming into the city seasonally, the pavement dwellers and so on, uh, to, to make a token income to support the village. Eventually, the village starts to develop a new equilibrium where it starts being mainly urban supported uh, and the agricultural income becomes secondary or even tertiary. That's the case, for example, in Poland, where in almost any visit, village you'll visit the older daughter working uh, as an office cleaner in the city of London will be sending an income back to the village that is two or three times the size of all the agricultural income and the EU and Polish government subsidies combined. China passed this threshold during the past decade, where now uh, remittances from the cities of China uh, now outstrip all agricultural income as the main source of rural income and so on. So the arrival city neighborhood, these neighborhoods I'm talking about are becoming the main source of, of rural income in the world and ideally the main source of development financing. At some point in the last three or four years, depending on which agency you ask, the world reached the 50-50 point of rural urban and if Conservative projections of trends continue. Uh, by 2050, the world will be 70% urban, and we can reasonably say that this will be the century when the most parts of the developing world will become as urban, more or less, as we are. Probably not in the same way. You don't have this development does not happen in parallel with uh, between the West and the South and the East, but certainly with some of the same effects, at least, because people around the world tend to change their way of living and have the higher living standards uh, when they shift into urban life. This is a place called Kuril, Dhaka, Bangladesh, probably the fastest growing city in the world, depending how you measure it. This here on the left is uh, Gulshan, which is the neighborhood that people like us live in, in, uh, in Dhaka. It's, it's where uh, pretty much the entire spectrum of the middle class lives. And to the right, across a sewage-filled lagoon, um, on a piece of land that in the beginning of the 1990s would have been just a grassy peninsula of municipal electrical utility land. Uh, you have a cluster of people that is somewhere upwards of 30,000 people living in a very densely packed area. Nobody's really counted them uh, properly. This is what people see from the high-rises of Gulshan looking down. Their view spoiled by what they see as a place of the fallen, almost an insect-like infestation of people. The people in the high-rises wanted eradicated. Uh, they complained to the government about it, unaware that their, their house cleaners, their prostitutes, their nannies, their drivers, all the people they need to get through daily life are all coming from down here into their apartments. This neighborhood is a product of this enormous rate of urbanization. Every day, hundreds of families arrive by boat and minibus from the north and the south. But rural villagers who wind up in Corral don't just fall there from the poorest parts of the earth. In fact, the ones who make it there tend to have invested heavily. They're the ones from the village who've saved the most. 
uh, who've often been sent by the whole village to come and make, in, make some urban income to come in. And those who have come here have often lived earlier in slums on the further outskirts of Dhaka that look nicer to us. But they've moved here for a couple of reasons. First of all, they have easy access to the, to the good jobs in the high-rise buildings there and in the garment factories nearby. But also, even more importantly, they can buy the patch of land beneath their tin shack. Not legally, because it's, nobody really knows who actually owns it. it was, it's a municipal utility who certainly never had any intention of subdividing it or selling it. But whoever sees control of it first will sell it with uh, an informal deed or certificate that is legal enough in their minds and in the minds of everyone around them to allow them to borrow money based on the rising value of that property and start a small business or do whatever you want with it. There is both jobs outside but also a cluster of opportunities inside it. First, it looks like this. It appears as claustrophobic and unhygienic as you can imagine. And then you start to notice things. You notice electricity is fully installed illegally, jury rigged in, as is running water through a improvised network of garden hose pipes tapped into the water mains and sold to the people in the tin shacks at a rate per liter that's far higher than the wealthiest people in the city would pay. This is a classic thing about these neighborhoods. And you see cable television everywhere. In fact, the, 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 the guy who gets you through these neighborhoods and introduces you to people and knows what village they've, they've all come from and how much money they're earning is the cable TV guy. And you often wonder why would people who are making not more than a couple dollars a day per family be willing to pay $3.50 a month for a package of uh, television programs. These are not for people who've fallen out of the edge of society. If you talk to the people about well, why they're getting cable TV, they'll say, well, essentially, we see ourselves as the sort of people who have cable TV. It may account for a ridiculous percentage of our income, but we expect it to be a tiny percentage of our children's income. And they should be the sort of people who have it. And you, you see these aspirational finger holds throughout the neighborhood once you start to look uh, closely. You see all manner of small business starting out within many video rental shops, huge amount of food business, a lot of photo studios, again, aspirational. You're not seeing uh, Indian scenes, you're seeing exotic uh, scenes of the Orient, of uh, North American forests, and a large garment industry springing up inside the slum. Sweatshops with maybe 20 or 30 employees owned by the slum dwellers, who are usually ex-garment workers themselves. There's also an enormous metalworking district and a big woodworking district inside the slum, as you see here, often working from waste products and so on, and uh, repurposing them into, into new things and so on. So there's a very large GDP uh, within a place like this. You also see a lot of video arcades, which at first, again, seem puzzling until you realize what they are essentially are informal childcare facilities. The state has no presence here other than police raids periodically. There is no schooling, there is no infrastructure, there are no mini bus routes taking people in and out. There's also no collection of taxes from people who actually probably would produce a decent amount of tax revenue. And you see fee-for-service schools springing up inside. I've been in slums in Mumbai where people live on earth floors where every third household or so you see a rudimentary PC in the back with the oldest daughter studying JavaScript programming or something, and an investment of the family that amounts to something like a third of their annual income or something. There's a lot of, a lot of hope in these neighborhoods invested in these type of activities. So you get guys like uh, this. His name is Ujjal Mia. He found work after being sent from his village, which was subject to a seasonal starvation that killed a certain percentage of its children. After scrambling on the ground and working as a rickshaw puller for a number of years, he found some work bundling together ethernet cables in office buildings. And that pays him $75 a month, uh, which is far better than garment pay or so on, which has been enough to buy, essentially, his family out of the village, allowing the other villagers to use urban incomes to consolidate their holdings and move a bit away from the subsistence sort of farming. Here's somebody who didn't make it, Maksuda Begum. Her husband died after two years there, which meant that they became a one-income family. She had to decide bet between her daughter or enough of an income to support herself in her village. So she put her daughter, who is eight, in some sort of school where she can see her once a month, all alone, without her husband uh, or any state support or without her daughter. She cries herself to sleep every night, stuck without being able to move back because her village is dependent on her and so on and essentially sacrificing her life uh, for, not for a bunch of people who probably she will never see their success uh, as a result of it, if any amounts from it. There are too many people like this who get lost 
uh, who get sent back because of the complete lack of, of support for places like this. Uh, generally, governments around the world have been very hostile to these neighborhoods. That's begun to end in recent years. There's been a greater understanding uh, in many countries that these neighborhoods uh, are actually the source of the next middle class and so on, if they're allowed to prosper. That certainly, if you demolish them, you're not just driving out a bunch of people, as China does every few years, uh, but you're also destroying the livelihood of a village somewhere and of a, and of a generation coming up within it. You're, you're creating sort of a, uh, a wave of, of damage. It's a fallacy that people move in a straight line from backward conservative rural customs to sophisticated secular urban customs. The period in between in these neighborhoods, these, these bottom rung neighborhoods with its insecurities, its need for tight bonds and supportive institutions, its threats to the coherence of the family and the person is often the time when new hybrid protective cultures are developed. And this culture of transition can be more conservative than uh, the originating village culture. We have to watch out for things that block the progress of these neighborhoods. We have to watch out for these barriers. We need to understand these neighborhoods, their function, and to invest in their sec success today because they're the place where the story of the 21st century is going to be told. If at the heart of the 21st century, as Doug argues, these uh, arrival cities are driving our future, I guess we need to think normatively about what that means, uh, not least what it might mean for uh, what the state does, what it might mean for how we think about the market, and what it might mean for what lies in between. I myself was carrying out some uh, research, uh, talking to people who were uh, the, some of the, the village clans who set up uh, the, the arrival cities for the migrants into parts of Shenzhen, which grew from a city of, well, basically a spread of villages uh, of 50, 60,000 to a city of, depending on how you believe the stats, somewhere between 15 and 20 million. What happened when the Chinese moved on uh, in trying to establish Shenzhen was that they allowed property rights so that the, the, the local villages could develop property in order to bring in the migrants and put them up. And what was told to me was uh, the, the story by uh, one of the, the village elders who described a situation wh where when originally, before the days of GPS, when Dong Xiaoping opened up, uh, the, the, the villages were determined by the spread of lychee planting. So the village, uh, the, the government inspector came to kind of define the borders of the village which were allowed to be developed, and he, he went out in the evening and defined the area of lychee planting. The villagers took him back at night, got him drunk, <laughs> completely drunk, whilst at the same time some of their compadres went out, dug up all the light cheese and buried them around somewhere else. They did this several times so that the village kind of expanded four or five times by kind of digging up the, the light cheese and replanting them and getting a bigger area defined as the Chungjun Swim. The reason for mentioning this, this story is, of course, some people win, some people lose as part of this. They're, they're in terms of Doug's argument, that one of the things that I think is interesting in parts of the book and in this talk that Doug gave today is this sense of trying to capture creativity depends on people being able to buy into the future of the arrival cities. Now for some people, not least in Egypt, the example we had at the beginning, that would mean that they need to buy into the property market going up. But for some economists, it's, uh, people who kind of take their lead from the classical economics of people like Ronald Coase, who would suggest you need clear markets, clear property rights tied to clear property ownership, what that means is what you need to do in these arrival cities is not destroy them, as Doug said, but to clarify the property rights. Um, what that's meant, and there's people like Timothy Mitchell have done a criticism, this is what happened in Egypt, is that when you have clearer property rights, people make a lot of money, just like those folk in China, and the, the thing moves on very, very quickly. And a different argument is that what you need is a pirate modernity. The real creativity is in places like uh, Delhi, a way you get the pirate the, pi the pirate videos, the pirate IT, you can go and get an Apple uh, that looks like an Apple, plays like an Apple, is an iPhone. It's just that it's made somewhere slightly close to Shenzhen, but it comes through a different route onto the market. Now, what we think about that is, is unclear, but one version is a very kind of pirate modernity. The other is a much more classical modernity. We might think about what the, the state does. Doug's described London as very successful through its liberal markets, allowing an accommodation and upward mobility of mi migrant groups. Um, but as it, you know, that, mi that migrant family, I think in the, in the book, and certainly in the, the street that you described, has taken the right to buy housing. Mm -hmm. It's bought housing from the state. So part of that was about what the state does and the state's interventions in making that kind of social mobility possible. And the final point I'd want to touch on is that it, it also 
what we might think about is how we look at some of the spaces that work and the spaces that don't work. There's a really beautiful book by Stefano Boeri, the architect, called Uncertain States of Europe, where he takes this, what appears to be a very desolate landscape, and begins to pick it apart, room by room, block by block, and finding the laundry that's not meant to be a laundry that's hidden in one part of the building, or the mosque that's not meant to be a mosque that's hidden in another one of the flats. And those kinds of creativity are sometimes not easily open to the eye. So what looks hostile in those spaces between the state and the market are sometimes hard to find, and we need to look for them quite carefully. You seem to lay out some a quite strict formula for success for arrival cities. You talk about transportation links to the city core, mm -hmm. direct access from the street to buildings, the opening ability to open a shop on the ground floor, and home ownership, and even you specify five stories as the ideal so that you can have sufficient density without the need for, for an elevator. But I'm wondering about how the needs of diverse cultures plays into this formula that you come up with. Well, the five-story building arrangement tends to be what develops organically when people have the ability to do so. I don't think it should be planned or ordained from the top down. Um, Often this has to do with undoing planning decisions that have resulted in these things. Uh, it, in allowing the spaces, uh, allowing the green spaces in between buildings to be filled in with whatever markets or so on people want to fill, fill them in with and so on. But aren't there cultural differences? I mean, you talk about cities so diverse culturally and diverse mm -hmm. not only across space but across time. The, the cultural differences are, are often shocking. To give one Western example, um, a lot of the public housing towers of Britain and other European countries were built with the, with, for, with the uh, sort of four-person family in mind. And there's had to be a lot of de-walling and so on uh, to account for the much larger families that come in from places. Although I should note that this, again, is a temporary measure. F family sizes of immigrant groups all fall to the family size of the host country within one point something generations. Uh, and so on. So there may have to be a re-walling a lot of a lot of uh, public housing and so on. But for an example from the developing world, uh, in Nairobi, uh, in many of the slums, there have been attempts to rehouse people uh, in what was thought to be legal minimum housing uh, to say let's let's move these people out of these terrible little tin shacks with with earth floors and put them into the legal minimum requirement for an apartment under the laws of Kenya. The problem being that that legal minimum requirement was about four times the size of the largest house in the slum. And it created this uh, interesting economic effect where people would either find ways to simply sell that flat to somebody in the middle class, because it was middle class housing, or they would subdivide it into four, five, or even six units inside uh, and rent them all out and live in one of them. So everybody ended up in a smaller and less hygienic space than they'd started out in, and so on. Uh, there's, there's a lot of work which I explore some of in how to prevent these perverse effects uh, from distorting attempts to do good in these neighborhoods. These are the cultural effects of people trying to do good in neighborhoods without understanding that the culture of the people moving in and their needs for physical space and for market space and so on are very, very different. In a lot of Western European countries, there's a lot of resistance to what people moving in from a rural area in North Africa or Turkey or Eastern Europe would like that neighborhood to be like. That the elegantly planned uh, Legoland looking uh, developments uh, are going to look a bit more like the souk for a little while. And they might not pass all the laws of, uh, of hygiene regulation and so on. Well, if you want them to work, sometimes it helps to allow that to happen for a while. People integrate culturally much more effectively when they've had a chance to integrate economically uh, and uh, having the right physical space to allow people to set up the economies that work for them often is the pathway to doing that. In the book, you say that the next arrival city, that the arrival cities could bring this next great economic and cultural boom or as we saw in Egypt, could be the place for the next explosion of unrest and, mm -hmm. and violence. And you say the difference depends on our ability to notice and our willingness to engage. More putting on is it individuals or the state? Who is the our that you refer yeah, to it's here? It's always worth in interrogating a we. Well, I think it, I mean, in, in, in India now, there's a clamor in some of the, the 
the, the places around Mumbai that you were talking about in, in mm -hmm. Delhi, likewise, to, to be de designated as slums so that in the slum clearance programs you can capture, you can capture value. So, so yeah. I think some of the, there are, we need to be aware of the, yeah, that's the unintended that's consequences yes. and counterintuitive that's effects. That's the opposite move, exactly. You, you want exactly. to move yourself down to slum status so you, in order so you can to capture all this development money coming in. Ab yeah. Ab absolutely. And in, in some of the, when you see some of the places you were talking about being cleared in China, what uh, I was doing in that same set of interviews, you find people sometimes moving all the family into the house that's about to be cleared because the Chinese state is paradoxically quite generous about making sure that the people get per capita redistributive uh, housing. Well, I guess so it's just one a of great example yes. of creativity, isn't it? A, re a re entrepreneurial response to the state's Well, also, also it's, 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 it's the one way into ownership because you tend to own those things, whereas the urban villages in China, it's very tenuous. I mean, the bulldozers never far. Uh, yeah, and yeah, the, the, as, as you were saying, people who make the money are the old, the old guys from the villages who have been there two, three hundred, two, three hundred years. The guys so who started out. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, there's there's a village called Dafen where uh, there is you can see they they make paintings. They make something like thirty percent of all the oil paintings in the world. But there's now Dafen Xinchun, where the people who owned the original village have actually built a new village about ten miles away. All of six-story condominiums, all very, yeah. very nice for themselves, and they just left the old village behind. Yeah, well, so essentially, the, the, the luckiest villager to be in China is the one who's on a village that gets encroached by the growth of the city, because then your, whatever they call the remains of what used to be the, uh, the, the collectives on the farm, be becomes essentially the proper develop, development corporation uh, that sells its illegally subdivided bits first to, uh, the squatters mm. from the villages who are living here, the 200 million people in China who are living w both in a village and in the city because they're not legally allowed to fully migrate. Remember, all, all, all property development in China is private sector, so uh, when, the, when the state authorizes the property development corporations to build the high rises and so on, and, uh, of, and often these ex-villagers do themselves, and they become very, very wealthy. And these apartment dwellers, these, these people, uh, the rehoused ex-slum dwellers of China are the new sort of political class in many cities because they're the, they're the first property owners. They're the, often the first people to play, pay property tax because this in the largest cities is a big innovation now. And they're the people starting to have political movements not aimed at the Chinese state, which is strictly taboo and nobody does it, but aimed at the municipal or even building association level um, where it's permissible to have activism. And it's this. I think this is the place to watch out for because this is this is the frustrated ambition of the ex-villager uh, manifesting itself in China.